אוקיי, אנחנו התחלנו. אוקיי, so שלום everybody again. It's good to be with all of you together again. Uh, what I see now mainly is I see mainly boxes with names. Uh, so I'll speak with the boxes and the names, the black boxes and the names. I, uh, I thank uh, the people who are not, but again, anyone should do what he's comfortable, he or she is comfortable with. Um, I want to dedicate this class. Uh, I want to dedicate this class uh, to my Rebbe, Rav Yehuda Amital. A Rav Yehuda Amital was the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshivat Haaretzion and Gush Etzion, which I had the privilege to be there for nine years. Um, um, I had this chus to know Rav Amital as a Talmud. Um, and he passed away 10 years ago. The Yorzeit was last Sunday. So we're mamish in the week of the Yorzeit of the 10 years. So I thought um, I would like to share with you in the next uh, hour and 15 minutes, or now it's a little less, um, I would like to share with you, uh, I want to give you, the, the title of the class is Basic Ideas in Rav Amital's Thought. Okay, and I think uh, it's, uh, he was really a giant, and um, uh, it's worth knowing some of his not trivial, I would say, ideas. He was, uh, he was a very powerful personality, influenced me a lot. I can't even measure. The more the times go, and you know, I'm a community rabbi already for uh, uh, more than 11 years, and his influence on me and on other circles is uh, not, uh, one cannot even assess it. And I would explain soon why. It's, it's uh, you know, we say these words about a lot of people, but uh, here there is even an internal reason for it, <clears throat> for why his, his influence is sometimes not noticed. And only when you reflect, you understand, oh, actually when I acted as a community rabbi in this way or, in that, or that way, I was even unconsciously, I was even not aware of how much his impact was on me. So I will um, uh, say a few words about Rav Amital's biography, uh, Mamash, very, very briefly, uh, because I think it's very important to know uh, these uh, uh, Few comments that I'll make now. I think it's very important in order to understand his uh, his uh, thought, his uh, his um, his educational me messages and and Jewish educational Torah messages that I'm going to share with you um, in the coming moments. So Rav Amidel was born uh, in Gross Berdin, that's uh, somewhere I think in the border of Romania and Hung Hungary. He was a Hungarian, a Hungarian Jew. Uh, was born there, um, not to a rabbinic family. Um, he went to Yeshiva Ktana. Uh, yeah, his formal education was very, it was always, a, his daughters told me with a smile that always when he went to some uh, ministries in, in Israel and they would ask him, how many years of learning do you have? So we would say some like four, because I think when, in fourth grade, he, 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 Tachlis, I think he finished his formal uh, education. At any rate, he was in a yeshiva as a teenager, a yeshiva ktana with a very special Rebbe that influenced him a lot. Um, this Rebbe uh, learned the Lithuanian methodology of learning Torah, learning Gemara, which is very different than the Hungarian method of learning Talmud. Yeah, the Hungarian method of learning Talmud tradition, I would say, of learning Talmud, is to learn Gemara, Rashi, Tosfos, and then to learn the Maharsha, uh, uh, which is a commentator, one of the Achronim that explains uh, all kinds of pshat problems, simple understand problems with the Gemara, Rashi, and Tosfos. And that was done, and, and a lot oriented towards psak, towards Allah Lamaid. So that's the Hungarian uh, 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 tradition of learning. And the uh, Lithuanian, influenced by Chaim Brisk, uh, is the analytic movement of really analyzing the conceptual, making conceptual analysis of, of laws that appear in the Talmud. 
And um, uh, this rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Halevi, who was his Rosh Yeshiva, it was a small yeshiva, he imported the Lithuanian uh, learning, and they had a vision. The young student, the young Talmud, Yehuda Amital, then Yehuda Klein, and his Rebbe, they had the vision and the dream of combining the Lithuanian uh, way of learning with the Hungarian and, and, and actually selling, I would say, importing the Lithuanian uh, methodology also to Hungary. These were their dreams. Actually, Rav Amital, I can say, because I learned a lot of Gemara from him, uh, he implemented it in our yeshiva here in Israel. But Tachlis, the dreams went away, uh, the dreams to make a revolution in the Hungarian way of learning uh, was born, uh, was uh, burnt in the ashes of the Holocaust, meaning uh, while he was a teenager in that yeshiva, uh, then the Holocaust uh, broke out and Rav Amita was in the camps, uh, in the lab, and it was in the camps all the years of the Holocaust as a teenager. He lost all his family, every single, he lost all his family, his beloved grandma, his parents, everything. He lost everything. He lost his Rebbe. He asked his Rebbe, he told us, Rav Amital, he asked his Rebbe, uh, what will be with our dreams? And his Rebbe uh, answered him a very powerful uh, answer. He said, we had our dreams, uh, but if Hashem's will now is that we'll do another mission, then, you know, uh, then this is our mission now, with all the respect to our dreams. Um, I think this, 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 uh, this, uh, this story influenced Rav Amital and he shared it with us because I could say about my Rebbe Rav Amital that he, he, the only thing that he, he was the, emplo the employee only of one entity, he was the employee of God. He wasn't afraid of anyone, Rav Amital. He was working for God, that's all. Very independent. At any rate, so he survived the Holocaust and here is another important story that uh, explains his thought. In the, while he was in yeshiva in Hungary as a teenager, this small yeshiva, he found a little book, a little booklet about the thought of Rav Kook. He describes that he read it all night and he was, and here I'll say the Hebrew term, nidlakti, I was turned on. That's it. This little book, booklet, was in his pocket all of his years in the camps. And he said that that helped him survive the camps. And Rav Amita, when he was saying Harav, you know, I had two Rashi Yeshivot, both are giants. I had Rav Amita and Rav Lichtenstein. When Rav Lichtenstein was saying Horav, he meant he was referring to, Rav, to his father-in-law, Rav Soloveitchik. When Rav Amita was saying Harav Zatzal, he was speaking about Rav Kook. He saw himself as someone who really uh, uh, takes from Rav Kook, and we'll continue with that, but in a very different way than many of the other students of Rav Kook, and we'll explain that soon. So he survived the Holocaust, then he made Aliyah by his own as a refugee, a young refugee went to the Hebron Yeshiva and studied there. In Hebron, he was known, uh, the stories went about him, uh, that, you know, uh, he, uh, one story said that he knew 10,000 response to literature by heart. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but, you know, no one tells such stories about me. Uh, he, uh, he what, what is definitely known by his roommates that he was going to sleep, you know, you're we going to sleep with a book. So he was going to sleep with responsa, uh, uh, shoot, with responsa books. He was uh, finishing volumes after volumes, and we saw that in yeshiva. That as opposed to many Rashi yeshivas and Rebbeim, uh, he was uh, very deep in Gemara. He was very, I would say, he was bright, he was brilliant, uh, but he. And you know, most of the people speak about Rav Lichtenstein's uh, learning. And of course, I'm a Talmud of Rav Lichtenstein. Rav Lichtenstein had a methodology and he really taught us how to learn. And he, Rav Lichtenstein was a giant in Torah and in Talmud, there's no doubt. But, you know, Rav Amital, in a simple way, uh, 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 all his, his, his classes combined the learning 
but he was always uh, learn uh, using also responsa literature. That shows uh, uh, something very, very deep about his personality. As it was said, he was a very, very unique combination of vision and practicality. We'll see that later, but here you see, even in this way of learning, in his Talmudic way of learning, that these shiurim were combined with classes, but always connected also to responsa literature. Yeah, the, the, the responsa literature that, by the way, usually Rashi Yeshivos don't use, and I even hate to say sometimes that are not that aware of, okay? Or not such, that don't have great pecuse in it, which he had. So, um, he was a learning in Hebron, but he, every Shabbat he went for Shalash Sudas to hear the talk of Rav Harlap. Rav Harlap was a student, a disciple, a student of Rav Kook. Not everyone in Hebron liked that. Uh, there was some criticism over the young boy, a uh, young Bachor who was uh, makpid every Shabbos to go and hear, uh, 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 and, be, and hear a sicha, a talk from a student of Rav Kook with the thoughts of Rav Kook. But Rav Amital, as I told you, was very independent. Uh, it was very clear to him that that's the right thing to do. Then the 40, he, he drafted to the Haganah and the 48 war broke out and he uh, uh, was a soldier. It was very, very clear to him. Just like he was later on in his life, in his biography, the founder of a, a Rosh Yeshiva, of a big, big uh, Hester Yeshiva that combines army service with the Torah learning. That was his philosophy uh, in person. He came to Israel as a refugee from the Holocaust alone, learned in Hebron. Once the 48 war broke out, he, he, he was a soldier. That's it. After the army, after the, the, the war, he wrote a programmatic essay as a young Bachor that uh, Rashi Yeshivot praised. The article is called, and I studied it, Ledarko Shel Chayal Be'Milchemet Akomi, Chayal Adati Be'Milchemet Akomi Miyut. The way of a religious soldier in the, for, in the independence war. And the, in this article, he lays down one of the most uh, at the at corners, at, at cornerstones of religious Zionist philosophy. Uh, uh, he is making a very clear distinction in this article between two terms, religion and Torah. In a nutshell, he claims that religion is an exile term and maybe even a Goyesha term. Religion is a very, very narrow term. It is, uh, uh, it is uh, focused on ritual, on ritual, uh, uh, religious service, etc., etc. He said, our Torah is Torah Chaim. It is not narrowed down to uh, shaking a lulav and putting on tefillin, although these things are extremely important. Uh, our Torah is uh, a Torah Chaim, a, a Torah life that is uh, actually expanded to all areas of life, including army, including state. Uh, this is how we out. This is what he outlined in that article. After he finished um, the the army, he uh, went to learn in a yeshiva with uh, uh, in a yeshiva of Rav Meltzer. And then he married the granddaughter of one of the Gedoylim, Rabbi Isser Zalman Meltzer. Um, after that, he moved to Rehovot, where his father-in-law, Rabbi Meltzer, had led a yeshiva, and he was a rabbi, a rebbe in yeshiva, Tadarom in Rehovot. In the 60s, the family moved to Jerusalem, and he just taught here in some seminars. He never planned to be a Rosh Yeshiva. He loved learning, but he saw himself as a simple Jew like his uh, uh, grandparents, you know, Maximum, a Rebbe, whatever. After the Six Day War, a group of, uh, a group of uh, young men who heard of Rav Amital and, his, uh, in, and how inspiring he is and what, what an interesting and powerful personality he is, they came to him and asked him to found and be the Rosh Yeshiva uh, in Kfar Etzion, Gush Etzion after the Six Day War. Rav Amital asked them, why are you coming to me? You know, he was in his an apartment in Givat Mordechai in Jerusalem and they, and Rabbi Hanan Porat, Zichrona Levracha, told him, look, 
one cannot stand on the side after Hashem made these miracles to us. And Rav Amidah was convinced. And the rest is, is history. He went, they went to a, a mountain empty of anything, just in no, middle of nowhere in Gush Etzion. And Rav Amital said, on this mountain, hundreds, hundreds of, of, of people will learn Torah in a yeshiva. One who would have come to see that moment would have said that Rav Amital is just, you know, a crazy man. You know, and not, there is nowhere here. And you're saying in this place, there will be hundreds of, uh, hundreds of, um, of uh, young men learning Torah. But that's exactly what happened. Uh, he was, as I said, a very, very powerful combination between vision and practicality and down to earth. Uh, I skipped one important point and then I'll uh, go, get, uh, then we're done with the biography and I'll go to the basic ideas of, uh, in his thoughts. When he was in Yeshivat HaDarom in Rehovot, he told his father-in-law that I'll say it in Hebrew and translate, Sarich lehagia lehesder im hatzava, that we need to get to a agreement, as there, we need to get to an agreement with the army regarding army service of yeshiva buffers. That's how the term hesder was coined, because of that sentence that he said to his uh, father-in-law, and they founded the seminar for teachers in yeshiva tadaron, which was uh, uh, the first has the yeshiva, this and KBY together, meaning from two directions, the Hester uh, started from Rav Amital in the seminar in Rehovot and from uh, KBY. That was the beginning of the Hester program. Rav Amital believed that, uh, 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 as I said, that the Torah is a Torah Chaim and uh, part of, uh, uh, and that, and as he wrote in many times, that all the wars that the state of Israel are doing against its enemies, according, basing himself on the Rambam, Rav Amital claimed that all the wars that, and the Rambam in Hilchos Malachim, that all the wars that are done against Am Yisrael are really wars on Yehud Hashem, on the unity of Hashem. Meaning there could be uh, all kinds of reasons for the war. You are occupying territories, you don't have territories, you're doing that, you're doing this. I'm just making the point that there were wars before we occupied the territories, there were wars. After we occupied the territories, there were wars. Before we withdrew from Gaza, there were wars. After we withdrew from Gaza, each time there is another reason, sometimes even some rational reasons, but he says, Pachlis, deeply under it, uh, uh, Am Yisrael represents uh, Hashem's presence uh, uh, in the world, and actually, all the war the wars are really on Yehud Hashem, on the on the unity of Hashem, and therefore, the value of a religious soldier who acknowledges that is a very very uh, uh, important value, and therefore, it's inconceivable that uh, 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 yeshiva bochars will not participate in the wars of Israel. That was his philosophy. That's how he educated us. And by the way, his son also went to Hester Yeshiva, meaning Rav Amidah was not a hypocrite. Uh, or whatever he believed in, that's what he, whatever he preached for his students, that's how he raised up his kids. This is true about both of my Rashi Yeshivas. And Hester, as opposed to KBY, Hester was Lechatchila. Hesder was not Bediyevin. That's the ideal way for a Torah person. That was very centered to both of my Rashi Yeshivas. Okay, back to the time that he founded the Yeshiva in Gush Etzion. Rav Amital's way of teaching us, and in general, was by telling us stories. Rav Meir Lichtenstein, the son of Rav Lichtenstein, said in a day of learning in memory of his father. He was speaking about a long article that his father wrote about Hester Yeshivot, was published in tradition. The philosophy of Hester, or the ideology of Hester. You could all find it, a beautiful article, very fundamental of Rav Lichtenstein. 
said Rabbi Mayer, after explaining the main ideas in this article, he said, as usual, Rav Amital was able to deliver the same message that my father delivered in a, in a long article, Rav Amital was able to deliver it in a short story. That was his way. And when Rav Amital founded the yeshiva, he said, he told the story to all the people who was, were there and he said, that's the idea of the yeshiva that we're now starting. And here goes the story. The story is about the Balatanya, the Balatanya, the Admor, the first Admor of Chabad. Uh, he was once, he once had to go from his place and learn in a certain house. In that house, there was also his grandson, the great Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, the Admor HaTzemach Tzedek. Now, the way it was that Rav, uh, Rav, the Balatanya was in the most, uh, uh, it, there were, it was room in front of a room. You understand? There was an entrance, and then there were three rooms. In the most external room, there was a baby in a crib. In the room, in the middle room, there was the grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek, learning Torah. And in the most interior room, the third room that was most inside was the Balatanya learning Torah. So the story goes, they were learning Torah and all of a sudden the Balatanya hears a baby crying. Since his grandson was closer to the baby, as I explained, the Balatanya assumed that uh, his grandson will take care of this. But the crying continued and continued. Once the Balatanya saw that the baby is still crying and nothing is moving here, he passed by the room where his grandson was learning, went to the external room. He saw that the baby fell from the crib or was somewhat uncomfortable. He fixed the things, calmed down the baby, the baby was calmed down, and then he went back. On his way back, he stopped by his grandson, the Tzemach Tzedek, and asked him, uh, excuse me, didn't you notice that a baby was crying here for several minutes? The Tzemach Tzedek was shocked, and he said, oh, I I'm sorry, I really didn't notice it. I was so much into the learning. The Balatanya told him, I'll say it in Hebrew, and then I'll say it in English. Limut Torah, shelo shomim imeno et bichyo shel atinok, yesh bo pgam. A Torah learning that is not attentive, that you can't hear from it, the cry of a Jewish boy, is a problematic learning. That's what the Balatanya said, and went back to his room to learn. This is a... Rav Amital defined this story as what he wants as the DNA of our yeshiva. Let's explain. In order to clarify, Rav Amital was totally for the concept that a young man of 18 years old should dedicate several years of his life to Torah learning. And when he dedicates his life for Torah learning between the ages 18 and 23, it's not that every other day he goes to a hospital to make chesed, or goes to this way, or goes to that. No, he's now focusing, he has a mission. Now he's building his spiritual uh, a ground uh, uh, to be a balabat, to be a good balabat. Uh, and uh, now is the time to dedicate for Torah learning. And yet still, the Beit Midrash should be attentive to the cry of the Jewish boy, should be involved. And Rav Amital explained, that means that to be open to the Israeli society, to hear the cries of the Israeli society. Sometimes the baby, said Rav Amital, i.e. the Israeli society, is crying and is not even knowing that it's crying. It's not even aware that it's crying. The, the Torah learning in the yeshiva, and the yeshiva should be such a yeshiva that is involved in, in, in this thing. Now, the message of the story is 
there are several uh, uh, there are several uh, messages in this story. The, the straightforward message that Ravamita stressed is, as I said, to be attentive to the cry, to be involved, the involvement, not to be closed in a capsula in a yeshiva, but to be involved in what's happening in Israeli society. That is one. But the other message, which is very, very central to Rav Amital's thought and personality, is the enoshiyut, to be a human being. The Torah was given to human beings, not to angels. Rav Amital loved, and therefore hearing the cry of the Jewish baby, that is not, you know, I can, I can assure you that there are other schools, unfortunately, Rav Amital disagreed with them. There are other schools, Orthodox schools in Judaism, that would say this story of the Balatani and, Baal Tze, and the Tzemach Tzedek, they would, say it, they would say it as a hesped to the Tzemach Tzedek, look how serious he was in his learning, that he couldn't even hear a baby crying because he was so much into the learning. <laughs> what a darga. Once there was a husband on a guddle that uh, when he was so much into his learning, he sometimes forgot the names of his kids. So much he was into the learning. My other Rosh Hashiva, Rav Lichtenstein, commented on that, and he said, I'm not sure that it's a praise. Okay? So I'm returning back. The fact that while you're learning, the fact that a cry is simple, Human gesture. You, it, r, r, the, the, the Balatani was a mensch. You hear a baby crying, you calm him down, even though you're learning. The Torah was given for angels with weaknesses, and they should acknowledge their weaknesses, said Rav Amital. And he wrote a book. The book is called The Aretz Natan Livnei Adam. You see the title. And the land was given for human beings, which means the Torah is lo b'shamayim. The Torah was given to human beings, not to angels. He loved quoting the Kotzke Rebbe's saying, Anshei Kodesh Tiyunli, Anshei Kodesh Tiyunli, that you should be to me, said God in Deuteronomy. Uh, uh, you, uh, holy human beings, sanctified human beings, says the Kotzke Rebbe, Angels? God says, angels? I have enough in heaven. I want human beings that are worshiping me. And that's why Rav Amital, as a chazan in Yamim Narayim, and he was a tremendous Baal tefillah. In Rehovot, they were speaking decades after he left Rehovot about his tefillah, and I could testify, I heard him for nine years. He's still with me. All of his simplicity, his authenticity, his, the, his, his, the fact that he was very authentic, a simple Jew, just a healthy, relaxed, simple Jew, not a Rosh Yeshiva, and had more who didn't want Hasidim. All of this was uh, expressed in his davening. And, he, and the two piyutim that he added in the davening are piyutim that are explaining the concept that even though Hashem has angels in, in heaven, he desired uh, his praise from simple human beings. So you see, as I said from this story, both of these messages, the, the, the enoshiyut, the, the, the fact that he was a, a human person, and by the way, this book, uh, the Arts Natan Livnei Adam was translated to English. It's available to, for purchase. It's called Jewish. Um, it's called uh, Jewish uh, Jewish Values in a Changing World, I believe. Yeah, Jewish Values in a Changing World. That's how it's called. And actually, uh, many chapters of it, most chapters of it, could be found on the web in the VBM if you do Jewish Values in the Changing World. So you could see some examples from there or even more than examples. At any rate, um, as I said, he was a simple, healthy, 
Jew. Uh, and uh, that happened to be a Rosh Yeshiva. Actually, when Rav Amidal founded the Yeshiva, he was planning just to found it and to leave the Yeshiva after he finds a giant to be a Rosh Yeshiva. He told, he told uh, all the, 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 the the young men that he, uh, young adults that were in yeshiva, that uh, he will leave the yeshiva. He wrote a letter to Rav Lichtenstein to America, inviting him to head the yeshiva. He signed in the yeshiva Yehuda. Rav Lichtenstein, had, that he signed the letter Yehuda. Rav, Rav Lichtenstein had no clue that it's a Rosh Yeshiva writing to him. He just thought it's one of the activists who was writing him. And he um, ended up, uh, uh, what happened is the only reason why Rav Amital remained the Rosh Yeshiva and didn't just leave the floor, leave the ground to Rav Lichtenstein to head the Yeshiva is that Rav Lichtenstein stipulated and insisted after he met him that he's willing to take the Yeshiva only if he will be a Rosh Yeshiva together with him. Um, you see again from here how, uh, how Tsanua, how humble he was and how, uh, uh, and what a simple man he was, just a very simple man. I remember sitting at a Shabbat table when I was in Torah Mitzion and Shlichut, we went to a Bikur Moledet, meaning we came to one month and after two years, between the second and the third year, we spent one month in the summer in Israel, the family, our family. And since we're close friends with his daughter, we spent one Shabbat there. And it just happened to be that I had, I had the schus to be in Shabbat meals with him. He was sitting quietly on the table as a grandpa enjoying his grandsons. He didn't uh, feel any obligation to speak or to, you know, he was just there. And I was not surprised, but it was impressive to see how, how simple he is, even though he was a giant. Um, I, said, I said something about uh, honesty, authenticity, and the fact that he didn't like any fabrications, anything that is, uh, that is uh, 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 not real. Here, there is a very educational message that he taught us. I wanna ask the crowd here, what is the highest level of tzedakah? Yeah, the Rambam outlines eight levels of tzedakah. What is the highest level of tzedakah? Actually, I even taught this here. In, uh, to this crowd like a year ago. Uh, what is the highest level of tzedakah? However, you could, each one of you can unmute himself, so don't worry about it. Just speak up. What's the highest level of tzedakah? There, there are different levels of tzedakah. I see there is silence. I don't know how to interpret that silence. I, mostly from black boxes so are they with me or I, it's only the name the white names on the black boxes the highest level of tzedakah okay what's the highest level of giving tzedakah the the, the most perfect way of giving a tzedakah okay so harold answers in uh in the in the chat that's helped to find a job that's correct giving alone giving alone Giving a loan or uh, 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 helping finding a job or doing a partnership with the poor, that is the highest level, says the Rambam. That's true. What is the second highest level? Let's say, since this is not mamish, literally tzedakah, right? You're, you're, you're finding a job, you're, you're making a partnership, you're giving a loan. Let's say if I really gave tzedakah. What is the highest level to do it? That's the second out of eight levels. What is the second, what is the most perfect way of actually giving money to someone? Without him knowing, that's good. Without him knowing and giving anonymously. We call it in science double blind. The giver doesn't know to whom he gave and the receiver doesn't know who did he get it from? That is, Maimonides says, that's the highest level in tzedakah. When you're actually giving tzedakah, the highest level is double blind. The giver doesn't know that he gave. The receiver doesn't know from whom he received. Comes Rav Amital and says, I heard it in my own eyes, in my own ears, <laughs> with my own ears. 
I heard it. And it's also written in that book, but he repeated that message. The same holds for educational and spiritual influence. The highest level of the educational action is when the educator is currently not aware even that he is now in an action of influencing, of educating, and that the receiver, the one that is influenced, the student, the son, the daughter, the grandchild, the granddaughter, are not aware they're, they're, that they're actually now in a process of education. If the two sides, the influencer and the influencee, if I'm allowed to say that, uh, are not aware that they're now in a process of being in an educational process, that's the most effective and the highest, the most ideal way of educating. Rav Amigal explains also why, and it's from both sides. When someone knows that I'm about to influence him, to educate him, naturally, there's some feelings of resistance, even a healthy one in general. The feeling of independence is a healthy feeling. It's a human, natural, and healthy feeling. And when I know he is going to influence me now, there are natural, there could be natural, uh, uh, um, impulses and actual natural feelings, motions of resistance. Therefore, when I'm not aware that I'm influenced, then I'm more naturally influenced. That's one, more effectively influenced. That's from the side of the one of the receiver. But not less important, from the side of the educator, of the parent, of the grandparent. If you know I am now educating or I now want to educate, there's something not authentic. There is a potential that your behavior here will not be authentic. When you are just acting the way you are, being who you are, acting the pashtas with authenticity, but as a role model, as a good example, as a personal example, then people are influenced by you because they don't sense something that is not authentic. Rav Amita once spoke with alumni. It's in a video, and it's very, very powerful, that sentence that they made, that he said, he, he spoke with parents and told them, sometimes parents are trying to be more than what they are. Call it show off, call it whatever. Sometimes out of being nervous that they need to influence their kids. He said, you know, your kids, even when they don't know how to speak that way, to verbalize it, but they sense when things are fabricated. They sense ziyuf, falsehood. When things are false, they sense it. Be who you are. Just be who you are. That's what he said. This is very important. And I told you in the beginning of our talk, that Rav Amita's influence on myself and on, on many of his students is in many, many wide circles and sometimes we're even not aware how much he influenced us. Only in reflection, I, I, I look back at some talks that I have with some congregants and I say, ah, actually Rav Amita was present there. You see that that was his way to influence without you knowing that you're even influenced. Rav Amital encouraged us. There are two more ideas that are flowing from that Torah that he taught us about tzedakah and education. First of all, uh, the, the concept of uh, uh, Kiddush Hashem and Chil Hashem. He's speaking here about one being personal example, a good personal example. Right? And that's, that's the most powerful way, actually, to educate. Just be who you are, okay? And that will influence the most. Rav Amitam, as a Holocaust survivor, was extremely sensitive to the 
things of Kiddush Hashem and Chilol Hashem. When he felt there is a Chilol Hashem going on by rabbis, by others, he was speaking up. He was willing to pay a very high price for that. But he did it. He did it because he couldn't stand silent when he felt that there is Chilol Hashem. That was a very, very sensitive point to him, Chilol Hashem. And of course, the value of Kiddush Hashem. What is Kiddush Hashem? He said many times. Here he quoted the Gemara in Yoma that was Paskin in the Rambam. The Rambam, based on the Gemara in Yoma, defines Kiddush Hashem as a person who is associated with Torah, that is acting nicely, that is, that is, very, that is praised by all the people, and because he's praised with, amongst all the people, then people are saying, ah, this is a Torah man. Ashrei mishalim the Torah. Blessed is the one who taught him Torah. The sages are learning this from the verse, the ahavta et Hashem elokecha. The ahavta et Hashem elokecha, obviously, that we said this morning, is not an easy puzzle. How can a person love Hashem? Do you see Hashem? How can you relate easily to Hashem and love Him? Many answers were given to that question. But one of the answers that our sages gave, only one, is that they're actually darshaning the Pasuk a little differently. They're making the vowels a little differently. Ve'ihavta et Hashem Ve'ihavta, meaning you should make Hashem's name loved by the people. Not ve'ahavta, but ve'ihavta. You should make Hashem love, being loved by the crowd. How do you do that? When you're acting with a personal example. When you're on the one hand, a person that is, you know, not speaking Lashon Hara, smiling to people, and, but not also detached from people. Holy and involved. That is what the Rambam describes there. So Rav Amita was a big believer in this. So this is one, another message that we see from the tzedakah slash education story. And yet another one is Rav Amital's education to us, he stressed it for independence. Rav Amital wanted his students to be independent. He used to tell us, Ani lo amitalim ktanim. I don't want little Amitals. And actually, in his Levaya, one of the people who, did eulog who eulogized him, I think his son, Rav Yol Amital Shlita, said, you told that you don't want Amitalim Ktanim, and it turned out that some of your students became, many of your students became Amitalim Gdolim, big Amitals. Rav Amital was an independent person, and not only that he was an independent person, he educated us to be independent. He didn't want it, he, he, he didn't make our life easy. He, uh, uh, when someone went, came to consult with him, so okay, he would uh, hear, uh, explain considerations and tell him many times, okay, uh, now, Kadima, you make the decision. Uh, Rav Amital opposed, opposed, he said that a personal responsibility, claimed Rav Amital, is an extremely important thing, personal responsibility. Uh, he was very reserved from the concept of Das Torah. He spoke uh, explicitly against it. He said that Das Torah, I'll just explain, Das Torah is a concept that the Chazonish introduced very much to the, the Israeli crowd. Das Torah is that uh, the, rabbi, the rabbis are telling you what to do in politics, are telling you what to do in all kinds of fields of life, Needless to say, you know, in all kinds of circles are telling you whether to go to that business deal or not, uh, whether to do this or not. Rav Amita was extremely reserved from all of this. Rav Amita uh, said, uh, it was not uh, embarrassed to say, and he, that's how he educated us, that they're experts in many fields. And uh, he's not claiming to be, uh, you know, some rabbis have the disease of uh, thinking that they understand in everything. Rav Amitav was very far from that. 
Doctors understand better than me in medication. If I need to consult regarding corona and what is pikuach nefesh, I'll ask the, exp I'll ask the experts. Uh, uh, issues of security and land, there are experts that I'll hear their opinions. And so it is with all fields of life. I'm not claiming to know everything. I'm a simple man. I'm a Rosh Yeshiva. That's true. But that doesn't mean that I understand in every field of life, a life everything. I have respect to other people who are experts in other fields. He was against us Torah, but here I want to warn from a little, little misunderstanding regarding his thought. That doesn't mean to say that he felt that rabbis should not speak up on, is on issues of economy, security, Eretz Yisrael, uh, Israeli society, etc. Not at all. As I told you, Rav Amital is the man who made the clear distinction between religion and Torah. And Torah means that the Torah is Torah Chayim. The Torah has a spiritual message and practical message, messages sometimes regarding all fields of life. No doubt. Rav Amital was the first one to say that. And therefore, it's not just that the rabbi's role is merely confined and, and narrowed to giving a talk in the shul and uh, uh, pastoral job and, uh, uh, and leading the services in the shul and giving Torah classes. Of course, that's a very important role of them. But Rav Amita was the first one to say that a rabbi should be, invo should be involved and that the Torah has messages on all areas of life. But yet still, these things don't have a status of a psaq. That's what's important. Uh, issues that are depending on all kinds of assessments that are relating to experts, etc. The rabbis could lay out some of the principles, but they're not becoming all of a sudden uh, the people that understand whether, they're, whether a surgery could, should take place or not. With all the respect, the doctor understands in some of these matters much more than the rabbi. So, the, so Rav Amita was um, uh, very much to uh, educating us, as I said, both to independence and, and, as I said, to personal example and to be just who we are, not to be nervous, to be something that we're not, but rather just to be who we are, acknowledge, acknowledge our weaknesses, and try to overcome them. The fact that a human being is limited and that this should be acknowledged. Rav Amital implemented it to himself in many manners. I remember once asking him a question myself. I asked, I challenged him with the question. And he said, you're saying that, he said, I, I asked him about how he acted regarding some matter that it seemed not coherent with some other things he said. So Rav Amital told me, Yesh li kushiot al atzmi. I have a kashis also on, a, on myself. <laughs> he wasn't trying to say, you know, to wash me away with some answer. He acknowledged the fact that it, 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 indeed it's a little problematic. First and foremost, he implemented it regarding his attitude to the Holocaust, which was very unique. And even a book was written about Rav Amital's attitude towards the Holocaust. As I said, Rav Amita was a Holocaust survivor. Already as a young man, a young yeshiva bachar, when his, what turned later to be his father-in-law, then not yet, asked him about the Holocaust and offered him some explanations, questions, theological explanations to Holocaust. Rav Amita was very stubborn in rejecting all of them. Rav Amital insisted till his, last lay, till his last day, from the minute he, 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 he passed the Holocaust, that the Holocaust is something that is not explained, is not explained and cannot be explained to us human beings. I want to explain why this is unique. There are Haredi approaches, some of the Haredi approaches to the Holocaust, the theological approaches, and now we are you know, we're in Chodesh so it's appropriate to speak about this. 
Uh, there are some Haredi approaches that are putting the Holocaust in the general paradigm of reward and punishment. Meaning, the Holocaust was a punishment for the Enlightenment. The Holocaust was a, 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 was a punishment for assimilation. The Holocaust was a punishment for Zionism. All of these explanations Rav Amital strongly rejected. Rav Amital said there is nothing on earth that can justify the slaughter of one million children and of so many gadolim. This is something that cannot be explained as a punishment. I can't imagine a sin that is so catastrophic as that deserves a punishment like a hol the Holocaust. Similarly, Rav Amital dismissed with strong words the explanation Rav Tzvi Yudha Kuk gave to the Holocaust. Here, as I tell you, that's a machlokas within religious Zionism. Ratzvi Yudha Kuk claimed that the Holocaust was a very powerful and painful, inevitable surgery, operation, that Hashem did to uproot us from the exile. Hashem acknowledged that we're not coming, and he didn't phrase it as a punishment, okay, Rav Tzvi Yudha, but he said it was an action of a godly, powerful surgery to uproot the people of Israel so that they will be, to, to uproot Am Yisrael from the Galat to Eretz Yisrael. Here, Amitel again strongly dismissed that explanation. Nothing can justify the horrors of the Holocaust, including the great present of the state of Israel. Rav Amitav was a Zionist. Rav Amitav was saying Halal and Yom Atzmaut. Rav Amitav was a soldier. Rav Amitav founded Gush Etzion. Okay? No one could question Rav Amitav's Zionism. Okay? He was heading Esther Yeshiva. But he said, even the great godly present of the state of Israel that were thanking Hashem with full heart, and actually, I quoted in my in 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 um, not the previous the previous previous class like a month and a half ago. I quoted you a paragraph from Rav Amital saying that we should thank Hashem and Yom Ha'atzmaut for having again our religious king our, our Jewish sovereignty reestablished. Rav Amital was not questioning all of that, but that cannot justify the Holocaust, even such a great present. Nothing can justify the, 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 the terrible horrors of the Holocaust. Also, Rav Amital didn't associate, identify with the explanation of Hester Panim, of, uh, you know, some people say that Hashem just withdrew in the Holocaust. Hester Panim, he covered his face. Yeah, that's a term in Deuteronomy that sometimes Hashem is covering his face and is kind of withdrawing from the world and letting the world run by the human beings with their evil freedom of choices like Hitler. Rav Amital didn't accept that too. A, I believe that he thought that this is such a terrible thing that here God should have intervened. But this I'm just saying from my own head. What I heard from him in my own ears that what he felt, and he explained it, that's a, a, he shared with us his personal experience as a teen in the camps in the Holocaust. Being in a life threat, many times, there's one time that he even said that he was hiding in a, in a closet and they opened many closets there and for somehow he was saved, miraculously. He said, during the Holocaust, I saw the hand of God. I can't say that it was a coverage of his, uh, of his face. It, this was too big. You know, my wife coined it, 
a negative miracle. <laughs> if you understand what I mean, meaning you, this is too big from being some a natural thing. In Rav Amital's, he saw, I saw Hashem, but I didn't understand, and I don't understand what is his message, what he was trying to say. Okay? Therefore, Rav Amital say, okay, we need to acknowledge no explanation. We have no ex zero explanation to the Holocaust. A human being's mind cannot provide an explanation to the Holocaust. We are left as simple Jews with a question. We're left with a question. We should be humble and know we're simple people. Sometimes we're left with questions. Um, okay. I want to add another idea of Rav Amital that has to do with uh, what I said that simplicity, simplicity and authenticity and not showing off. There is a sicha, a talk that Rav Amital used to repeat and say again and again in Parshat Kitisa or in Parshat Shkalem. As you know, uh, every, every Jew is commanded to give a machzis a shekel, right? To give a half of a shekel. And as you know, uh, just like Bibi's presence, there's no difference between a rich and a poor. Everyone gets the same amount, or in this case, everyone gives. In Kitisa, everyone gives the same amount. Everyone gives a machzis a shekel, half of a shekel. The wealthy, the poor, every single Jew gives the same thing. Rav Amital said, yes, but everyone brings his, gives his own input, his own spiritual input in that giving. Meaning, externally, all the Jews are doing the same action. While internally, it is expected that everyone will do it in his, with his kavana with his way of identifying with the mitzvah. The same Rav Amital said, based on Achmanides, regarding the presence of the, you know, when the Mishkan was inaugurated, when the tabernacle was founded, inaugurated, then all the pre presidents of the tribes gave their, um, gave their presence, right? Their donations. Now, the Torah repeats this, these donations again and again and again and again and again. Right? We read it in Hanukkah. That's our learning in Hanukkah. And the question goes, why does the Torah repeat the same donation for 12 times? The Torah could have just stated briefly, each president gave the following. Okay? The Torah knows to do that. Here again, Rav Amital said, each, each president, they all gave the same donation, but each one had his own meaning in it. Comes from Amitah and says the same as regarding mitzvos. Each and each one of you, each one of us is putting tefillin in the morning. We're doing the same thing. Yet still, each one should put his own input there. What Ravamitah stresses here in this opinion is two things, and both of them are important. On the one hand, Ravamitah wants us to do the things with our heart and to do it with personal identification, to bring your own personality to Avodah Hashem. Then it won't be technical. That's on the one hand. But on the other hand, Rav Amita was very reserved from the people that need to be unique, meaning, I want to do the mitzvah differently. I, knew, I want to do this I, I, the mitzvot are not enough for me. Rav Amital quoted the saying in the Gemara that one who makes a vow, it's as if he built his private altar and gave an offering outside of the Beit Mikdash in his private altar, which is forbidden to do. So Rav Amital didn't like that. Rav Amital, and, and, and the Torah 
and the Gemara, sages are reserved from people accepting on themselves vows to do extra mitzvot. Chumrah is a good thing only when there's an internal coverage to it, said Rav Amital. Chumrah is a good thing only if it has an internal coverage to it. But you should find your own personality in Avodah Hashem while doing the same thing that all of Am Yisrael is doing. You don't need to deviate yourself. You don't need to look different. You should be very normal externally. You should be normal externally and inside there should be the fire. Again, because you're not, that we're not interested in show off. It's not that people need to know you are unique. You need to know that you're unique. You could do the same mitzvot that all of Am Yisrael are doing. You don't need to do different things. Within the framework, within the framework of all Am Yisrael, there you could find your own unique uh, actualization. Okay. Ravami tells another message has to do with our own Parsha. With our own Parsha. Ravami Tal said about Sefer Dvarim. In Sefer Dvarim, you know, in Shira Sazinu, it says, Binu Shno Dor Vador. Says that Moshe, in, in the first verses of our Parsha, Dvarim says that Moshe explained the Torah to the people who are coming to the land. He started his speeches. This is what we're going to read in two days from now. And it says, Binu Shno Dor Vador. You should understand the ways of every generation. Rav Amital said, quoting the Gera, the founded the, the Rim, the Rebbe that founded the Hasidus of Gur, that the Torah have a mess, has a message to every generation. The Torah is relevant to every generation. Binush no dovador. Concept contemplate every generation and generation. The Torah has a message, message for every generation, and it's the job of us, the rabbis, the Torah people, to explain the Torah in the language, in the way, by being involved, by hearing the cry of the Jewish baby, to deliver, to make the Torah relevant to each generation. That is why Rav Amital, was very conservative in some manners. It was a tremendous combination of being conservative, but on the other hand, extremely open-minded and very open for renewal and very open even to reconsidering re his own views on some matters, not only on political views. I'll give you an example. When Rav Lichtenstein made Aliyah from America in the 70s, he had a chavrusa with his daughter in Gemara. That's what he learned from his father-in-law, Rav Soloveitchik. In Israel these days, even in religious Zionist circles, it was extremely odd that uh, the ladies are learning Gemara. I even remember it as a kid in the 70s. That was weird. Extremely weird. Rav Anatol wasn't for it. There was even a writ an article that he wrote in the 70s saying that he doesn't see any points in, 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 in uh, girls learning Gemara. Doesn't see any point in this. Well, as some of you know, in the, in the new millennium, at the first years of 2000, Rav Amita was a very, very big supporter of the Beit Midrash and Migdalos for ladies with the Gemara curriculum, he said openly that he changed his mind. He said it openly, that he changed his mind. And he uh, even uh, brought the biggest donator to that, Beit Midrash. Uh, so here again, he was not embarrassed to reconsider his views, to change his views with times. Binush no Dor Vador. Also, uh, even regarding other issues like, let's say, the philosophy of Rav Shagar uh, regarding postmodernism, was very reserved, but then 
in, a, in an evening that was done half a year before Rav Shagar passed away, he said, we didn't understand you. We didn't understand you, Rav Shagar. Now we see that your ideas are very important. He was not embarrassed to say openly that he changed his mind. He was reconsidering himself. His mind was working. His heart was working all the time. Uh, I'll finish perhaps this year with another important idea from Amital that I think is, is worth what, much more time, but I'll just say it briefly. Or you know what, first I'll add two more uh, implementation of humanity. You know, we're gonna blow the show for soon, Bezrat Hashem. Where do we learn from that there are 100 tkiot, that we have 100 uh, tkiot? Uh, the Arminag, to have 100 blowings of shofar. We're learning it from a very weird, weird source. The mother of Sisra was crying 100 times. Now, why do we need to learn from this wicked, uh, the mother of this wicked uh, 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 king, that she cried 100 times when he didn't return from the bell uh, that we have to blow 100 times? He said, a mother's crying for her son, even if it's an evil person, but a mother's crying for her son is the most authentic sin. We see that even from that wicked, perhaps, lady and wicked king, that was a moment of truth. This is a thing. This is the most authentic thing, and we can import it. I think that that shows you also Akeda. Akeda. We'll speak about Akeda here. I'll add more things about Shofar and Rav Amital. Some people picture the Akeda as Avram Avinu, the big believer, just obeying God's commandment. Rav Amital said yes. Rav Amital, uh, 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 Avram Avinu, the big believer, had heard and obeyed in an act of obedience to the hard commandment of God, went ahead to sacrifice his son. But Rav Amital says, does it mean that, Rav, that, that Avram Avinu didn't feel then, in these days, his natural feelings towards his son, his painful feelings? Here Rav Amital has a great innovation. All of us say in Slichos, Mi she'ana le'avaraham avinu behar hamuriyahu yaneinu. You know, at the end of Slichos, we have a whole bunch of Mi she'ana le'avaraham, Mi she'ana le'yitzchak, Mi she'ana le'yakob. The one who answered Avraham Avinu in the Moriah mountain, he will answer us. Question comes, where in the Torah did you see that Avraham Avinu prayed to Hashem in the Akedah? Look there in Parshas Vayera. You won't find it even with a microscope. It doesn't say anywhere that Avraham Avinu prayed to Hashem. And yet the slicha that we're saying is saying explicitly, the one who answered Avraham Avinu in Aram Moriah will answer us. He proves from other sources that Avraham Avinu apparently, while going to sacrifice his son, was praying and begging Hashem that the Gzera will be removed, that this decree will be removed. Avraham was praying to Hashem that his son will be saved, that he won't have to do it. Again, it's not that the holy person is not hearing the cry of the little child. I go back to the story that I began with. The holy person has feelings, has human feelings, and that's his praise. Have natural father-son feelings and compassion and relationship. And this is the, the, the right Ovid Hashem. What I wanted to mention in a minute is just that Rav Amital also believed as part of the place that he gave to human beings and their powers and their weaknesses. Rav Amital said that natural morality, natural morality has a big weight. It's not just that morals and ethics is only what God commands. No. Hashem he quoted the Chizkuni saying that, you know, why was uh, Cain punished? Cain 
had a get very good legal defense. Cain could have told Hashem, and also the people of the Mabel could have told Hashem, you never commanded us not to steal, or Cain could have said, you never commanded me not to murder. It's true. There is no explicit commandment, but you were born in God's image, and therefore you know that. There is natural morality that is stemming from, our, from the fact that human beings were created in God's image. Therefore, he quoted uh, the Hungarian rabbi who wrote that one is not allowed to eat, uh, you know, cannibalism. One is not allowed to eat human flesh, and it's not written explicitly in the Torah, but it doesn't have to be written in the, in the Torah. It doesn't have to be written in the Torah. Uh, you, it, it is the biggest sin to be a, ca a cannibalist. If the Torah would have mentioned it, by the way, as one of the items that are not kosher, human flesh, that would be degrading, you no, know, uh, uh, putting us as if we're one kind of animal. So there's a reason for that omission. And you, out of your natural morality, you should know better. So this is a very important concept of Ravamita. And Ravamita, as I said, was a simple man. He didn't want people to wish him that your son would be a guttle ador. He said, I want my son to be a good Jew. That's all. Rav Amita, as opposed to many Rashi Yeshiva, didn't see his task as creating Rashi Yeshivas. That too. But he wanted to create Yeshiva Bachars who are involved in all areas of life. That was his mission for the Yeshiva, including Rashi Yeshivas and Rebbein. But also, not some religious people, but deep religious people. Yeshiva buffers that are involved in all areas of life. So I'll finish, I'll conclude the, 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 this year with that. Uh, of, you know, again, uh, it, it was, uh, uh, he inspired us a lot with his authenticity, his striving for truth, his influence, his sensitivity to Kiddush Hashem, is uh, um, educating us to be independent and not to be someone who are not, but to have the burning fire, but to be it, as he loved to quote that Midrash, that the burning fire is closed, meaning you don't have to show up yourself. You could find your uniqueness while doing what all of Israel is doing, natural morality, and influence by personal exa example and Kiddush Hashem. Okay. So uh, have, a, have a meaningful fast and Bezrat Hashem Yibane Beit HaMikdash. Okay, we're going to